Dr. Amir Nair, a full-time job practitioner in Hyde and Greater Manchester, Chair of the Association of Greater Manchester Local Medical Committees, Chair of the World Health Innovation Summit. Uh, since 2004, uh, the practice has enabled over 10,300 patients, about 84 percent of the practice, uh, to view uh, what their conditions have written about them, uh, including free text and uh, code information. The title of the talk is Access and Perspective, Patient Access, and Thank you very much.
and I created a little sort of game thing where it would choose 10 random words from A, B, C, D, whether in French or in English. Um, and every night before I went to sleep, I would run this program and practice. And three weeks later, that same teacher asked any question, even the most convoluted phrase that you could think of, I handle straight up. Straight up, and had the answer to every single one of them. And everyone turned around and said, how the hell have you done that? And I said, oh, it's this computer program I've got. Now, the reason I share that story with you is because that taught me that computers could educate us. It could help us in a way that I've never seen before. But then there came a point where I had to make a decision about whether I wanted to go to computers or uh, do medicine. Um, my parents were both GPs. They saw where medicine was going. They could see I had a bit of an interest in IT. But what they also saw was that the, the respect um, and the excitement of medicine was going even back then, 40 years ago. And they really wanted me to consider going into IT. So I had a choice to make. Do I go into IT or do I go into healthcare? And ultimately, it came down to that IT is like a pen. It, it's a tool. But when you're a doctor, you put, as far as speaking, you put your hand around someone's shoulder and you journey with them. And yes, you might use computers and IT and all that kind of stuff, but you're actually with the patient and you're making a difference for that individual. So of course I chose medicine, much to the dis uh, dissatisfaction of my parents because they could see where things were going. And then I finally got into medical school and um, after the first lecture I was at Manchester Medical School and the dean had given uh, that sort of congratulations speech that well done, you know, you're entering the medical fraternity and all that. And then we went into a tutorial, and I remember in that first tutorial, the tutor asked the question, if you were to project into the future, where do you think the future's going to be for you? And each person sort of described what they did. And they came to me, and my future was going to be walking into a photo booth, closing the curtains, and you get a full MRI scan, it takes a blood sample, it takes a urine sample, um, it, it recognizes that your arteries are getting inferred, it automatically does some kind of robotic surgery and clears out all the arteries and sorts out, replaces your liver or your kidney if it's not working. And 10 minutes later, you open the curtains, you come out, and you get this printout of all the things it's done for you, and you walk out like with the photo booth. The funny thing is that when I said that to my colleagues, and this was day one medical school, they completely freaked out and they said, Do you want to be a doctor, do you? <laughs> because they thought that was the most abhorrent thing they'd ever heard of. Uh, but there you are, that was, that was day one. Of course, I qualified, uh, became a GP, and got married. Uh, and my, my wife uh, would have a child. Um, and most people tend to look them, but my wife said to me, no, 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 you, you can't look them, you've got to take responsibilities. Um, I want you to settle down. Um, she had an uncle of hers who was a GP in Cheshire, so she said, why don't we apply for a job in Cheshire? And the job came up at Market Street, in Cheshire. Um, I applied for the job, rang up the, uh, the uh, practice manager and said, where do you want me to send my CV? And he said, 21 Market Street, Great Cheshire. I didn't click immediately on the blur. My wife sat next to me and said, isn't that where Shipman used to be? I called back and said, is this where Shipman was? Yes. Is that a problem? And my brain went into overdrive. And one of the things that my trainer had said taught me is that as a GP, you're not expected to know everything about everything. But you should be able to deal with anything, whether it's downtown in Crestover, Australia, or whether you're in Gaza and getting bombed at the moment, that's people that have this very moment in time, you should have some idea of how to support people and signpost them and, and all the rest of it. And I sat there and thought, well, as a GP, I'll be expected to see <coughs> chest infections, heart attacks, throats, um, the odd pregnant lady, and yes, I might get a bit more depressed and anxious patients, but I'm sure I'm going to have help and support, so I said, no, it's fine. And in fact, this is the story, I started on the 1st of October 2000, and two days later the BBC ran an article. And at the very end of it, there was my senior partner who said, Dr. Cummings, and added, it's going to be a good practice, a smoothly run practice, and we are going to regain the trust and confidence of the patients, as far as anyone can. I only saw that six years later, uh, but I thought it was, it was interesting what she was talking about and what we were going to do. Little did I know that 20 years down the line I'd be standing here sharing my story about how we rebuilt that trust and what we did about it. So I started as a GP in 2000. Um, and then in 2003, a Bengali patient whose English wasn't very good was asked to come and see me. Um, the nurse was concerned about his diabetes. And my opening question was, how's your diabetes going? 
His answer completely freaked me out. All my training as a medical student, all my training as a junior doctor, as a GP registrar, by then I'd been a GP for three years, had not prepared me for the answer that he gave. And his answer was very simple. It's fine. Now what's difficult about that? That seems very natural, doesn't it? The problem is that this chap's diabetes was horrendously out of control. Um, you get diabetes if your H1C is over 48 on two occasions. If it's over 60, then you're probably in the bottom 10% of the practice. This patient's H1C was about 140, 150, and had been like that for six years. But of course, he wasn't playing with chest pains, he wasn't on dialysis, he wasn't blind, he hadn't met his legs or anything like that. So as far as he was concerned, he was fine. And what I could also see was that over the past six years, he'd seen my doctors and nurses every three months religiously. They'd stepped up his medication, increased the dosages, started on second line treatment, third line treatment. But what the computer was telling me was that he had not ordered a single prescription in the last nine months. <laughs> so he was literally walking in, getting a prescription, binning it, and probably injecting mangoes into his bloodstream to get <laughs> to get I don't know how he did that. But it completely freaked me out because I wasn't going to be that silly doctor that says, oh, I'm going to tell you about all the risks that you're taking because he'd already had that and it hadn't worked. And I didn't know how to deal with that kind of person who did not recognize the risks that he was taking. Then in 2004, we found a way of being able to download the whole GP electronic record onto a disk. And we did a project with the University of Manchester, and Claire Harris was a PhD student at the time, um, looking at a conceptual model that would allow patients to access records. In fact, it was myself and uh, Dr. Richard Pitton, I'm not sure if he's here today or not. But the two practices did this piece of research, and my job was to try and identify some patients so that they could look at their disk and um, look at their medical information and try and make some sense of it. And one of the people that came was a lady called Margaret Rickson, who sadly passed away now. She was about 78 years old. She'd come to see me. Uh, she lived in a high-rise flat uh, on her own. Um, she last um, presented, uh, sorry, she last went to school at 16, and after 16, her parents had asked to leave school um, because women didn't need an education back then. Uh, and, uh, and she came to the surgery, and I said, Margaret, I'd love to give you this disc. And she said, what's that? I said, it's a computer disc. I said, Dr. Hannon, do you know how old I am? I said, yes, I do. That's why I want to give you this disc. And she goes, I wouldn't even know where the front end of the disc was with the back end. And you want me to eat? I said, well, it's your personal health information in there. So be careful with it. But I want to know what you're going to do with this disc and see if you can find out something about your own health. Um, if you can't find where to go, then come back to the practice because we've got computers and those days we have copy disk drives and things and we will, we will show you how to do it. Anyway, a few, few weeks later she came back to me and it turned out she went home and in her, when she went home in the local um, newspaper there was an advert for a computer course. So she joined this computer course to learn how to use computers and as part of the course she was expected to do some homework. So she went out and bought herself a laptop so that she could then practice for this course. And when she told me this, it completely freaked me out. Because I said, I never told you to buy a laptop, and a thousand pounds for a laptop, and for someone like it was a huge amount of money. Oh, no, Dr. Hannah, it wasn't you. I wanted to do this because I wanted to learn about this stuff. Uh, well, of course, she went on and became an incredible role model for the whole world, really, to show that elderly people can not only just uh, you know, access their records, but they can, they can order a few prescriptions and things. And there's a the picture of her doing that. Of course, we had other patients as well, and Yvonne Bennett was another one. And as we started to encourage more and more patients to access their records and didn't really know what that was all about, they would, we would put talks on in the practice and we would educate the patients, the patients would educate other patients about what it meant and some of the difficulties that they'd had. Uh, Yvonne here is talking about the patients at <coughs> two different hospitals and they didn't know what was wrong with them, and the other person that seemed to know what's happening was the patient. And so if she had access to a record, she'd be able to share the information with the other doctors and nurses to get the care they needed. And in fact, here's a picture of Margaret and Yvonne and myself uh, at the NEC, I think it was in Birmingham, and there's a sign there saying, meet the patient and the practice of the future, just to give you some idea of what we were trying to do to try and encourage people. One of the proudest moments that Margaret had was being voted as one of the top 50 um, innovators in the, in, the, in the NHS in 2004. 
famous by H.S. and there's a really proud picture of her, and she had that on the wall, that she'd been recognized and won some of the greatest people in the country. But she was recognized as a patient to be an innovator herself. And as I say, uh, we started giving patients access to the records, and this is one of the early photographs I've got of the first sort of 30, 40 patients who got access to the records. And it gives you some idea of the kind of people who've chosen to, uh, to, to, to get it. And in fact, one of the most surprising things for me was when I suddenly got a letter from the Prime Health Care Specialist Group to say, we would like to offer you the John Perry Prize back in 2006. Um, I had no idea who this organisation was, <laughs> what they were. I still don't know who it was that decided to give it to me. What I can say to you was that at the time, only 50 of my patients had access to their records, and yet they've recognised the John Perry Prize for it. And of course, this was at a time when the National Program for IT was there, at the time, it was the biggest uh, non-military IT project in the world, five billion pounds. They were talking about connecting all these different hospitals and GP surgeries together and everything. And there was me with my 50 patients who've got access to their records and suddenly I've been given this prize. In fact, I rang my mum up to tell her that I did this and she cried. Because she said, if there was anyone that was bringing the IT world and the medical world together, it was going to be me. And the fact that the British Computer Society had given me this prize, was recognition of how I bring those two worlds together when they seem to be very, very far apart. Um, that was the title of the talk. So whoever wins the John Perry Prize this year will, of course, have the accolade of then having to come and present tomorrow. Um, I'm very sorry I can't be here tomorrow. I would have loved to be here, but unfortunately I've got pressures in the practice. Um, but that was the title of my presentation, Building Trust, Special Access to Records. Um, I actually found the original presentation and I've asked to put it onto the BCS website. So if you go on there, there's a link there now. Um, it's well worth having a look at what I thought the issues were because you'll be surprised how relevant they are even today to 2023. In fact, that's the, um, the, the, the um, certificate I got. And there's a picture of me last week in my GP surgery and I've still got that very proudly on the wall as a recipient of the, uh, the John Perry Prize. So if anyone says, why do these things matter? They do matter a huge amount at a time when you think, well, why do anyone care about what you're doing? Of course, I then started giving presentations and talking about some of the stories about patients accessing their records, and they were great, people loved them, uh, but there were academics in the audience who turned around and said, oh, that's all very well, but unless it's in some sort of peer-reviewed journal, it doesn't count for anything, so I had to write a paper of some sort. I could talk, talk about screenshots, I could talk about my experience with shipments, practice and patients and things, but I wanted to do something very fundamental, something different, because I recognised this changes everything. And so my very first paper that I wrote, I actually wrote with a patient, that's very different to you, if you adopted the right doctor themselves, I chose not to, and I called it Towards a Partnership of Trust. Um, and um, um, So I did that, and then very soon after that, I realised that this isn't just about accessing records, this isn't just about looking at your data. There's a paradigm shift going on in healthcare, and I needed to explain why there was a paradigm shift, partly because of the experiences that I've been having with these patients and the kinds of things that they were telling me about what they were doing, and why I felt that this, because for thousands of years, you would go to your doctor, your doctor would do some kind of move, you put something on their chest, and say, I'm going to blood test, x rays, whatever. You'd go away, you had to wait in the waiting room. And only when the doctor called you in, and the doctor would then tell you what's wrong. We were breaking those rules that have been around since the Hippocratic times, where suddenly patients could see the information possibly sooner than even I had. And that's why it was a paradigm shift in healthcare. And then, of course, I wrote a paper by our own journal, providing patients online access to their primary care computerized medical records, a case study of sharing and caring. And in fact, um, I was the conference organizer for one of the uh, meetings for the primary health care specialist group. And the title, the theme, the, the, the conference was about sharing and caring, uh, partly based on the paper I had written. So if we forward on, what is this partnership of trust about? It's recognizing that there are, I used to say three experts in the room, but I'm now going to say there's five experts in the room when you come and see the doctor. Yes, of course, as a doctor, you're trained on how to take a history, how to examine someone, how to come up with a differential diagnosis, do investigations and tests, refer and so on. Yes, I might have knowledge about the local healthcare system that I don't have here in Chester, for instance, so my expertise lies with where I'm working hard. Um, but the patient is an expert too, and their expertise lies in their body, what works for them and what doesn't, 
what they're able to do. So if they're able to climb a hill and then suddenly find they can't do that because they're getting breathless or they're getting chest pains or they're eating food and they're getting burning pain or they're losing weight, I wouldn't know what the problem is with this patient unless they tell me what's wrong with them. So their expertise lies with their cells, their physical health as well as their mental health. But not only that, they also, she might be, or he might be a, a father to a child. He might be looking after a mother. Uh, he might be looking after uh, his children. And so his expertise lies not just about himself, but the people around him, or where he works. And then, of course, I don't know anything about him, but when I put his name into the clinical system, I think of beauty. It's amazing how you can, it suddenly throws up lots of information about that person, and within about 30 seconds, I can see where this patient is up to. So the problems related to medications, allergies, consultations I've had, consultations that other people might have had, um, test results, letters from various different hospitals and things. Um, if I'm not sure how to deal with back pain, I might be able to go on to clinical knowledge summaries, which is a branch of the, uh, of, of, of the NICE, to see what NICE guidance says about things. And if I want to refer this patient to another, uh, another service, I can use something like e-referrals and put in back pain, it'll show you all the different providers and where I can put appointments into if there are appointments to take. Of course, the patient also is carrying a mobile phone, and there may be information on that mobile phone that may be helpful. In particular, if you're carrying your phone with you, it records how many steps you're walking, for instance. Or you might be able to see information that you've read about the health conditions that you have. And then finally, um, there's the practice website where there's information about what the practice does and information that patients can look at so that they're not Google searching and they're convincing themselves that they've got a heart style up and they have cancer and they're going to die and actually see trusted information. But the important thing, and this is what I learned with the patients that I have, was that that clinical system that was focused at me, if I turn the screen around so the patient can see the same information as we can, then we're moving into a very, very exciting space. And I call that the partnership of trust. It's no longer just about the doctor and the patient, but it's that space in the middle where you've got the, uh, the mobile phone, the electronic health record, the practice website, plus the clinician, plus the patient. Five experts coming in to try and start to work out what we're going to do. Now along the way, we, uh, we, we have various other people. And Ingrid Brindle, who became the chair of the, um, uh, of the patient participation group, was an incredibly supportive uh, support supporter. We would go out and give talks together at various conferences um, around the country, trying to explain how things work and trying to explain this partnership of trust. Because sure, as a doctor, I'll be able to talk what it means for me as a, as a clinician, but she would talk about her experience of what it felt like as a patient on the other side of the fence. And I mentioned Dr. Richard Pitter, uh, who was an incredibly helpful person, helping me to understand some of the concepts around this. And Richard would arrange talks uh, where he would invite the public and the press to start to learn what this means. Um, and, and he felt it was a very, very important part of, we can't just be talking about what we're doing privately within the consulting group, but actually share it with, with all and sundry as and give people the opportunity to ask questions and challenges as well. One of the most proud, proudest moments that Ingrid Brindle had was when she was invited, in fact, we were invited, to speak at the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare to a global audience to talk about this. And there was me standing next to her while she was presenting. And I took a quick photograph. I thought, Dr. Hannah, what are you doing? And I said, I'm taking photographs. I think this moment is a really important moment where that patient on a small place in Hyde was now standing on a global platform to talk about, to the world about what this all means. But coming back to that day at the John Perry Prize, when I was standing explaining what it was all about, and I was talking about the partnership of trust. And in the audience, there was somebody who came up to me, and he said, Armin, can I, can I talk to you? Because I need to understand what this partnership of trust is all about. There's something about what you've said. I've been around the system for 20, 30 years. I've never heard what you're talking about. I need to understand this. And sure, of course. So we started talking. And I would literally talk to him for four, five, six hours a day, every single day for two years. I kid you not. My wife used to wonder who the hell are you talking to? Because I'd be there till two in the morning chatting. And all the way through for that two year period, he'd be asking me, what does this mean? What does that mean? What are you doing? And he'd give patient details away. We talked about how it relates to the partnership of trust. After two years of talking like this, six hours a day, every single day for seven days a week, I then said to him, 
Well, what, what do you do, by the way? Um, well, it was Glenn Griffiths. <laughs> and Glenn said, I build websites. And I thought, oh, what kind of websites do you build? And he goes, well, well healthcare websites for GP surgeries. And remember that we've been talking for two years about what this partnership of trust was and talking about the kind of patients that I've been seeing day in, day out. So if you can imagine talking to a full-time GP for two years to understand what our world is, but he had all his knowledge about computers and websites. And then he turned around and he said, Armour, I think we should build a website, shouldn't we? So we did. We built hgmc.co.uk, and it went on to win an award for being the best website uh, in, in the country, a practice-based web portal for the 21st century for patient healthcare. It was built from the ground up to support the partnership of trust, this recognition of the experts that were in the room, of the patients that are looking at their records and then start to understand what it all means. And that's a screenshot of what it looked like. Of course, um, Glenn would come along and Ingrid would come along and here's Bruce Elliott who did a brilliant blog on Confuse.com as a patient. And we would talk about these issues and try to understand what it meant and, and continue to share our experiences about things. And what Glenn was telling us, the number of hits that we were getting were off the scale as far as the HWC website was concerned. So patients were using this as a way to try and help manage their care. But there was another side to all this, and that was the professional standards. And so this is Dr. Brian Fisher, Dr. Richard Fitton, and myself. We went down to the GMC to talk about this because we were concerned about what potentially could go wrong, the harms from getting access to the records. When we would go around talking to people, what we were doing, clinicians out there, GPs out there, would say, we're really frightened because we think we're going to get sued. And we, all three of us, we were all three GPs, we said, well, that's really strange. We're not frightened when we go into the surgery. And they were genuinely scared about, uh, about what might go wrong. And it started to dawn on us that maybe, just maybe, the way we were consulting, the way we were writing things in the records, the way we were dealing with issues, meant that we weren't frightened but that knowledge and experience wasn't transferred over to the other GP colleagues who were very scared about it. And so we called a series of meetings at the General Medical <coughs> Council, hosted by them, where defense organizations, various royal colleges attended, various um, uh, patient groups, National Asthma Campaign, and British Heart Foundation, people like that, all came together, Alzheimer's UK, all came together, and we produced some guidance. Uh, and we produced some guidance for clinicians on how to enable patients to access their electronic health records. This was hosted by the Royal College of GPs and it also had the support of the Royal College of Nurses. And it just, it was recognizing that there was a professional standard that was also needed to support it. And in fact, there was an article that the GMC published called The New Partnership of Trust, describing this. So Graham Cato at the time was president of the GMC. We were a bit scared that he might, or the GMC might come down and was like a ton of bricks, saying, you're sharing harmful data, you're sharing third party data, um, and, you know, we can't have that. In fact, he turned around and said, no, absolutely not. This is what good medical practice is all about. This is what good shared decision making is about. How can we support you? And hence why we went to the GMC and produced the guidance the way that we did. Anyway, let's forward on. And as you can see, there are a number of apps available at the Evergreen, uh, among the sponsors of today's event. So thank you very much for having us here from Evergreen supporting today's event, it's essential that you continue to support these kind of meetings to happen. We've got patient access, which was the uh, EMIS version, and of course, lastly, the EMHS app. But I want to talk a little bit more about this paradigm shift that I, I mentioned. And I think we're moving from what's called industrial age medicine to information age medicine. And industrial age medicine is this pyramid where you've got self-care at the bottom, or what some people think is no care, primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. The problem is that when it comes to who views things as better care, patients think that if I can get referred to the professor at the tertiary centre, then I'm going to get the best care possible. Of course, the system turns around and says, no, no, get them out of the tertiary care to secondary care, get them out of secondary care to primary care, get them out of general practice into the home, because um, that will reduce costs and all those sorts of things. Of course, that's viewed as worse care. And there's this constant battle going on all the time because the patients want to be referred on, and we're saying, no, you don't. And then that creates all sorts of energy, complaints, and all the rest of it. And that leads to burnout of clinicians and patients being very hard done by. And I actually think that this system is now completely and utterly broken. No matter how much more money you put in, 
that tension is just getting worse and worse and worse, which is why this is broken. So where do we move to? Well, I call it industrial age medicine. And in industrial age medicine, you have a self-managing patient supported by the clinician and technologies around them. If they're not able to do it themselves, then there's a care network, so maybe family, friends, or peer support groups that might support you. Of course, with the best will in the world, you're not going to be able to diagnose your own angina or your COPD. So you are going to have to go to a healthcare professional, but that healthcare professional works as a partner, working with you, not telling you what to do. And about the only place where you are completely reliant on a clinician is going to be on the intensive care unit when you're tube and ventilated. But I would argue that even there, if you've got an advanced directive, then even there you are exerting your self-care. But the important point about this is nobody wants to be told what to do, which is why a self-managing patient supported by clinicians and technologies is a win-win both for clinicians and patients. And that is the information age, and that is the paradigm shift that we need to move towards if we want to get away from all the burnouts and all the negative stories that we're getting at the moment. So how do we take a passive patient into what I call a flying and power patient. Well, the first thing is you need to engage with that person. You need to create an interest in them, show them why they might be interested in wanting to do this. Inform them about what they can do. Engage them and say, listen, I'm gonna help you. I want to activate you, but to activate you, there are things that you're gonna to have to do. I can't do it all for you. Coca-Cola knows this, that you need to advertise someone five times before they actually do things. And of course, I learned that. If just you tell someone to do something, they don't always do it. And because they're not being told by everybody else, I'll, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll speed up because it is important. This, but this is really important because you need to reactivate that person. They need to be told five times. But when they do do that, and when they have a particularly bad experience, when they go to A and E and the doctors don't know what's wrong with them, they get really angry and they come back and say, "What's, uh, you know, why, why did the doctor not know? You told me you put some passwords in and you can do it." I said, "No, you do, not the, the doctor, not the nurse." And remember, even in the integrated care system. I've come from Greater Manchester, Chester, by Paul Hill today. The wonderful electronic health record that might exist in GM is absolutely no use to me here in Chester. We have to recognise the reality of the world we're in at the moment. We have to do that one out here. So you get through an explicit consent process, you get access to your records, you then become a flying, flying and power patient, but there's just one big problem. And that is, we're all going to die one day. One day, we're going to see an x ray, a blood test, a scan that actually isn't something that we're pleased about. And at that point there, when you become frightened, there's got to be a safety net somewhere where you can turn to. So, this is me in the GP surgery. And you start with somebody um, who's a child who's got nothing wrong with them, they think they're going to live forever. Um, they then start drinking, they start to put on the <coughs> McDonald's all the time, but they don't have anything wrong with them. They then get high blood pressure, they then get diabetes, they then get heart disease, they then get heart failure, they then get dementia. The other thing, of course, is that if you've got a physical problem, you're going to have a mental health problem, which just adds to the costs. And the problem with the NHS is that we're only interested at this end because we can make loads of money. We can't we can, we can sort of save people. But the trouble is, the damage is already being done. The question is, what are we doing down here to support people so that they don't get up to there? So our process is uh, we have a, the new practice website. And if you click, it's hmc.co.uk. If you click on there, uh, there's a video there ex explaining to you what you need to do. There's a questionnaire that you complete. It literally takes two minutes to complete the questionnaire. I'd recommend you to have a look at that. Um, and then we, we, we then grant the access. The important thing is this idea of responsible sharing. And the idea being that there's that electronic health record. We go through the questionnaire. We then give the patients access to the medical record so they can see it. And then when they present wherever they do within the healthcare system, whether it's in the AD department, out of hours, whatever, and that doctor said, oh, we've got this super fandangal shared system that allows us to look at your records. Do you mind if we look at it? They can actually give an answer because they've seen their own record themselves and they're happy about it. I have not been able to see my own records. If someone asks me, is it okay for me to look at my record, or for them to look at my record, I wouldn't know how to answer it. I know that GP records have, 30% of them have errors in them, and I don't know what those errors are. So if someone asking me to look at the records, I well, do you mind if I have looked at it first and make sure it's correct or not? And of course, if you looked at your record and then do it, you can give a proper informed consent for that person to look at that record and see it. In terms of data sharing, yes, we've talked about patients accessing the records, but of course we've got the GP record uh, for us GP, the nurses to look at that record. We can share that with the primary care networks or across the locality uh, or across the ICS, which is two to three million people. And then summary care record, 
cafes across the whole country. But why stop there? And why not think about a health book like we have Facebook? So we start thinking about a population, a global population of two to seven billion people. And they start thinking about data sharing in a much more holistic manner. Very briefly, uh, just very quick, when a patient, we engage with the patient, we ask them to complete a questionnaire, they answer the questions, we give them an opportunity to be able to answer any queries that they might have, we then check the medical record to see if it's okay for them to have access to their records, we then send them a message to say, yes, you've got access to your records, and here's some information to help you understand it, uh, and then we publish our data every week to keep people informed about how well we're doing and what's going on. Main exclusions, clearly it's an explicit consent process, so they have to be able to give consent. If you've got dementia, you're not going to be able to do that. The digital divide is a real problem. Although 97, 98 percent of the population now has access to the internet, there are individuals who don't have any family and don't have anyone who's on the internet, so they're not going to be able to do it. And then, because there are no time or resources devoted to this, everyone's very, very pressured at the moment. And then there's a large group that say, well, I don't really need access, so why should I, why should I bother? And that's a real challenge. Problem areas, severe mental illness, child protection and safeguarding, and of course coercion. And lastly, we've been talking about domestic abuse and the problems around that. I've talked about the practice website. And uh, on the practice website, we have practice services. And it helps people to understand if you've got access to your records and asthma or diabetes or blood pressure, what does that mean? So people can learn for themselves. But just recognizing that the pressures that we have in the general practice at the moment, we're not just seeing patients. There's a whole load of other things that there's lots of uh, meetings, uh, care home ward rounds, population health management, disability reviews, appraisals and revalidation, CQC monitoring. There's a whole load of things that means that we don't have the time to get to do this. So the challenges that we've been facing have really been around ongoing issues around not being able to sign up because people don't know what to do, forgotten passwords, patients unsure what it means, especially things like blood test results. When signing people, how do we onboard people so that they get the best from the practice, not just accessing their records, but use that access to appropriately use the resources that we've got. Maintaining you know, easy access for patients. If patients are going to have access to their records and they shout help, it's no good saying to them, we'll see you in a month's time. So it's thinking about how can we make sure our front door remains open. The digital divide. Releasing our admin staff to process requests rather than doing everything else that they're doing. Uh, reduction software isn't really good enough, unfortunately. Our staff are constantly moving because they're not happy. Clinicians are now leaving. 10% of GPs have left in the last eight years. That's about five million per, uh, worth of patients. Um, and then trainees and medical students are still coming in. We've never heard of access to records because it's just not being taught. Here's our latest data uh, from the 1st of October. And as I said, 81% of our patient population has got full access to medical records from zero right through to 90 plus. And here's just showing you some of the proportions. And you can see. Uh, oh, 86% of patients with anxiety and depression, 97% of those who are pregnant, 74% of those with a learning disability. I started with a learning disability patient, and you can see how I went about doing that. So, I will try this, but I just do need to talk about respective access. We've been talking about this for 18 years, uh, we started in 2004, and the government, NHS England, with, along with the BMA, decided to think that maybe perhaps way forward to have prospective access. And so from the 31st of October this year, um, any patient walking into a GP record, a uh, GP walks out, if they just download the NHS app, they can start seeing the free text from that date onwards. I've got some real serious concerns about this. And what are they? Feeling your records, including free text, is not the same as booking an appointment to ordering a repeat prescriptions or even sending a text message. It requires a great deal of complexity, and that's where the risks lie. It requires a different set of knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and there needs to be some kind of knowledge development to help people support them in the way that I've described. A clinical role has now become a term ministry. Oh, just download the NHS app and you can just read it. And, and as a consequence of that, there is no trusting relationships. There is no linkage between the patient, the clinician, and the record. And I feel very strongly that the Royal Colleges, the GMC, the NMC need to get behind this to start to think about the education, training, setting expectations, set the KPIs for trusts and boards to support this. This isn't just about downloading an app. We need to overhaul the NHS Choices website and also other health education apps, websites. Go to Diabetes UK, go to Asthma UK, look at what information they're providing. Are they really supporting patients with this? It's not just about safeguarding concerns. It's also about thinking about how we break bad news. What about those who lack capacity? What about those with severe mental illness, those with personality disorder? 
people or who are in coercive relationships and we don't know anything about them. We haven't excluded them and they're being put, put at risk as a consequence of that. What about those practices that are failing, that haven't got enough doctors or nurses or run by locums? They've got other problems that they need to deal with and now they're going to have to deal with the patients looking at their records and seeing what's going on. We've got to start to think about how we prioritise this rather than just saying it's going to be the same for everybody. There's no risk sharing going at all. So the onus lies completely on the data controllers. If something goes wrong, the ICO, NHS in rule data, it's not my fault, you know, you're, you're the data controller, you deal with it. Access to a clinician is already very difficult, and this could make things even harder for people to be able to access their record, uh, access their clinician when they need them. And there's this mix of economy, isn't there, light access, the prospective rather than the full access, and what do we do with that? What happens when a patient moves to a practice that didn't want to offer it and comes to our practice? Well, I can tell you our practice, we switch on the full access. And if they start seeing what the previous clinician has written, how's that going to, how's that going to affect things? There's been no investment, and so it's not a must do. It's not a priority for anybody. And as a consequence of that, um, we're seeing all the consequences of poor practice that comes out because there's been no investment to support people to do these things. And as a consequence, the health inequalities are going to widen rather than lessen. While those who know that they can do this will do it, and those that don't will stay in the dark. In fact, uh, my medical student um, from Imperial came and did a quick project, and she wrote a paper in the BMJ talking about empowering underserved groups to access electronic records. And in particular, the symbol, she identified three key lessons. Define and identify under-reached groups for the, local, uh, for the local area. Direct communication with a healthcare professional is key to engagement. Investing in a dedicated support system is essential. And digital services need investment to ensure sustainability. That's what a medical student who came to my practice for four weeks figured out that the rest of the system just hasn't even thought about. <laughs> Here are some slides. I'm not going to say any more other than the fact that the BMA has completely supported what I'm talking about as an individual, recognising what the concerns are, very, very worried about how they're being pushed into doing things. Um, they're continuing to engage and lobby with everybody, but we are very, very worried about a process that just allows anyone to see anything without a support in place. What they did recommend is that we should do a data protection uh, impact assessment, uh, which is what we did, and the recommendation from that was not to give access unless people have gone through a consent process. So I feel that we should put a 104 code in place for those that haven't gone through a consent process, as long as the practice has an opportunity for giving people access to their records, and there are funds to support the training and ongoing needs, both at practice level, PCM, locality, regional, and national. And boards have got to take ownership of this, because they're the ones who set the KPIs. They decide where the funding goes. So I very clearly state that it's NHS England's board's responsibility to look at this, and not leave it to GPs to try and figure it out. So the future isn't just about access, but it's also understanding with appropriate consent and it's responsible sharing. There is a mixed economy of access with light, prospective access, uh, and to full access, which will continue. We also need to think about retrospective access, and that's not just the paper records, um, or not just electronic records prior to the 31st of October, but also the paper records that come before it. And finally, artificial intelligence is coming and we need to think about how artificial intelligence could support the human intelligence. Last week, I chair, I'm chair of the World Health Innovation Summit, and I gave a presentation talking about climate change and sustainability within healthcare. We have a massive role to play if we can get the digital service to support care for both patients and clinicians that can help save the planet. And my final slide, what's the point of all this? And it's a starfish story. Walking down a beach, and you can see a boy, uh, so you can see a man and a little girl, and every now and again she bends over and she seems to throw something into the sea. As you get closer, you realise that there are thousands and thousands of starfish, and this little girl keeps coming, bending over, picking a starfish and throwing it into the water. So you go up to her and say, what are you doing, little girl? There's thousands and thousands of starfish here. You can't possibly save everybody. And she bends over, and she throws another starfish into the sea, and she says, I made a difference for that one. Thank you very much. as well, and the trust that the government has when people get 
big data and, and access to AI and private companies accessing that. And it, I'd be interested to hear your perspective of the difference in trust at, at the scale of GP to their patient versus the bigger national and, and in some ways international programs. We've got a real massive problem throughout the world. Uh, people have been monitoring trust um, across many, many countries over the last 30, 40 years have seen a massive decline um, all out throughout the world, in, 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 everywhere. Uh, the most extreme example of that, of course, I mentioned the Gaza, is just the building of what's happening the UN uh, and the laughing stock uh, that we, we're all in, and we're all in it together as, a, as people on the, in, uh, you know, on the planet. Um, I think there's a real problem around governments. Uh, the government systems have gone wrong big time wherever you look, whether it's inside the NHS or outside. It seems that those who are the most powerful, who've got the most funds, are the ones who are driving change, and it seems that they are no longer listening to the little guy. But remember David and Goliath, that if you become too big and you stop looking at the detail, uh, bad things happen. For me, I think Shipman, which I walked into, which I had no, uh, no idea about, taught me how a system as highly regulated the NHS can enable an individual to cause so much harm that even now, 22 years down the line, I have patients who are still talking about shipment and the harm that he's created. So there's a much, much bigger loss to be had if we continue like this. And I would implore anyone in senior positions to please, please, please connect with the ground, with the front line, clinicians and patients. The closer you are to them, the better it is. I've just shown you that I'm in my GP practice as full-time GP, but I'm still working on the global level. My chief executive travels around the world and he's going to be at COP26. Uh, later this year, or 24 rather. Um, and I'm working at a regional level with Chelsea Association GMLMCs, um, and I'm bringing what I've learned on the ground to try and help us to produce systems that are more trustworthy. But it has to be explicit concern, there has to be governance. You cannot break rules. If you do, it'll come back to violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.